in order to implement microwave radar, which was the thing that was hot at the time, we had to have tubes that could be made into oscillators, local oscillators for receivers or low noise RF amplifiers. And the tubes available with the wires in the base and whatever, it just had too much parasitic inductance to even resonate at those two, three gigahertz frequencies. So this one, the electrodes are just disks of metal that conveniently fit a um, coaxial cavity that you would have to tune the thing. Mm -hmm. And a fellow named MacArthur, E.D. MacArthur, and Jim Beggs were the guys who were developing this tube. And I was the guy who was taking the tube and making circuits for it, uh, uh -huh. cavities. And they would make these tubes in the laboratory, and we made the cavities. And this is the time of the Battle of the Ball, Battle of Britain. We would make tubes during the week at the lab, put them on an airplane, and take them to England, and install them in systems immediately. They never went to a warehouse. It was that <laughs> kind of a thing. So we knew we were doing something that was important and necessary to do. And so this um, tube and a few others that were made by Bell Laboratories were a key to developing microwave radars for the RIF to use. And they could, do, with the microwave radar, detect the conning towers of submarines that were killing our Lend-Lease fleet of freighters that were supplying material to England. So it was a breakthrough in radar to be able to overcome that U-boat trouble. So oh, the uh, advantage of these was the much higher frequency oh, right. than the standard radar that we went into. Yeah, the standard World radar, War II oh, right? Was I should much have, lower frequency. The standard radars were around 200 megahertz. So that that yeah. and because of that long wavelength, it couldn't see small objects. Exactly and right. Accurately yeah. determine their exact yeah. distance. Exactly. So the importance here was to go to much much higher frequency. Yeah, right. It's, uh, yeah almost 10 times higher frequency, yep. which required uh, an entirely new concept in yep. tube manufacture. And, and, and circuit design then also, instead of using to go wires, with, you right. had to use right. coaxial. Uh, and, and we made power. various versions. This is a higher power version, so they got to be used as also as transmitters, but the basic transmitter for the microwave radars was the magnetron, which had been developed in England, and the design brought over here and was being implemented in various places in the U.S. Uh, Raytheon was, that's how Raytheon got started, for one, and we were making them here in Schenectady. So the transmitter was typically a 10 megawatt, a 10 kilowatt peak power magnetron and a lighthouse tube receiver. Uh -huh and uh, just many, many millions of these tubes were made, I'm sure. The, uh, the, it's an electro electron tube. It's got a filament in it, which is connected by a standard f tube base. It's on inside, and the outside of the f filament and the cathode are connected to this big base. That's the cathode. The grid is a parallel wire set of grid wires, just, mm -hmm. just one layer, that's the grid. And the anode is just a copper rod and a seal. And of course, the problem was to make what they call a disc seal. That's a that that's not a trivial problem. With the these tubes had to be processed at some 900 or 1,000 degrees, and all the expansions have to match so that the thing won't break on the processing, and come down and still be strong enough to be put into a circuit. And so, uh, one of the developments that was done at the lab was to develop a, an interface between the metal and the glass. It's essentially a mixture of oxides, a layer of mixture of oxides that transition between the metal and the glass, so it's a strong joint. That was, mm -hmm. As many times, a technical concept is no good unless you can realize it in actual pieces of metal. And this is one of the okay. things that we were able to solve, this disc seal joint. Mm -hmm. And then we learned an awful lot about uh, circuit design, uh, 
Cy Raymore and John Winery were our cohorts at that time, and, and uh, they did all the analytic work for us. They, some of the very earliest computer modeling on a thing called a differential analyzer that was built mm. by GE over it. It was housed then actually in a, the old GEAA building. Des designed some of the um, tubes for us. One of the problems you have is transit time of the electron from the cathode to the anode. If it gets too long, it, it doesn't match up with the wavelength of the three gigahertz. So we. One of the problems of design is to make a smaller and smaller gap and still have it not mechanically short out. Right. So there were an awful lot of activities and a lot of, fortunately, as we were talking earlier, we had a bunch of people available of all different kinds of skills, analytic, mechanical, electrical, chemical. We had to learn how to make clean parts and it all worked out. <laughs> and it was all under exceedingly uh, time pressure to, oh, to yeah, get absolutely. these, as you that, said, they yeah. were being shipped yeah. to the uh, yeah. radar sets in, yeah. in Britain at the time. The thing I can say of the World War II period, 41 to 45, was people were focused, gung-ho. They didn't have to, for one, we didn't have to worry about a, a market. Yeah, we had already a market. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, uh, a lot of things got done. Well, we didn't, didn't, not everything worked, obviously. We had some pretty some mistakes, too. But uh, anyway, this, this is probably the key thing that was done in Schenectady. In that it was called the vacuum tube department when I came. And it, soon after Pearl Harbor was renamed the Electronics Laboratory, before the Electronics Laboratory existed in Syracuse. The GE company had an electronics laboratory in Schenectady with the two buildings on the roof that I was describing and the offices were downstairs in building five. 